I'm going to talk to you guys about testing, as I think is one of the one areas in DevOps that we haven't really addressed yet, um, and we'll go through some some points today. So uh, I travel a lot and talk to a lot of customers all around the country and abroad as well. And these are some of the testing experiences that I've picked up um, when I was traveling. Number one is ambiguous or no requirements. You know, that's something I see a lot where, you know what, if you don't have clearly defined business requirements, you're not going to get very clearly defined applications at, on the other side of it. Um, and it's something that we're going to talk about a little bit more detail a little bit later on in the presentation. And really, testing for some organizations is the last line of defense. It's the one thing they ignore the longest. And right before you have to go live, we realize, oh crap, we need to do some testing quickly. Um, let's quickly run a couple of scripts, get a few checks out, and then we deploy into production. Um, unfortunately, that's half, most of the time causing more issues than solving any problems along the way. And some of the reasons why we do testing so late in the HDLC is because of lack of environments, right? I mean, it's great from a dev point of view. We've started to embrace agile methodologies. You know, we've started to use Scrum, running two weekly sprints, and it's great, and we're knocking out new builds. But ultimately, testing is still lagging way behind uh, dev from that perspective just because there is not enough test environments to test all the bulls in, right? And also test data is another issue that also, um, how can I say, um, hinder um, continuous delivery uh, within software development projects. And then really, like I said, QA is the one discipline I think is not really agile yet. And also partly because a lot of the things that we still do is manual. There's still a lot of room for automation to be had within testing. So how good are you really at eliminating the barriers between ideas and outcomes? You know, I think on the one, it's actually unfair for organizations to be measured um, to, to newer companies, startups, and unicorns that's valued at a billion dollars or more, where these companies have started from a clean slate, right? And they were able to build their technology stack, whereas a lot of companies and companies that you guys work for have a heritage, you know, of possibly decades that you've been in business through mergers and acquisitions, through legacy systems, mainframes, and a lot of technical debt. So how do you compete with the unicorns of this world if you have all of that technical debt in your organizations? So it's really quite difficult. So we've come up with this thing called the software factory because we do believe that every company is becoming a software company. And uh, we do believe that it doesn't matter in what industry or sector you are, that software is redefining the way that you do business. I mean, long gone are the days we have brick and mortar stores and dial-in call centers. Nowadays, everything is done through your mobile devices and your, your PCs. So really, any organization needs to have a digital presence and a digital uh, sales channel um, if they're going to um, grow or even survive going into the future. So really, the modern software factory is broken up into four key areas. Um, firstly, it's to create an agile business, and I think, you know, most people are on board with this one already. You know, you need to change the culture in your organization, and I think DevOps goes a long way in starting to embrace that cultural shift that has to happen in organizations. But then you also need to start building better apps faster. If you're going to compete um, in the industry, then you really need to be able to, to knock out new products a lot quicker. I do speak a lot with the financial services sector as well, and for them, their biggest threat is not the other banks, say for instance. For them, their biggest threat is coming from Google and Apple, because if you think about it with Google, Google Wallet and Apple Pay, if you're going to start using those kind of services to transact, you're taking valuable information away from the banks. So the banks are effectively becoming like a clearinghouse, right? So the whole thing around what's my uh, user's buying patterns, and what do they buy and sell, and, and how do they transact online? All of that information now sits with Google and, 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 and Apple, and they lose valuable insights into information that they can use to market and build new products and services towards. So it's really about how do we get those apps out a lot faster. And then security become a competitive advantage. I think, you know, because we're in this application economy, um, you know, digital threats and... Um, 
breaches is even more important than ever before because once you hit the media that there was a data breach that has reputational damages to your organization. And we actually see that about 70% of data breaches is actually coming from inside the organization, not outside. So again, how do we look at that? And then maximizing application performance. In DevOps, it's about monitoring everything, right? At every stage of the SDLC, we need to be able to monitor and bring those metrics back to enhance and improve the products that we develop. So those are the four, four main components of a modern software factory. And different organizations will start in different tiers of, uh, of this. The one I'm going to focus on is building better apps faster, and in particular, continuous testing. So this is a pyramid um, slide of an actual customer of ours. Uh, and we've asked them, you know, how much testing they do across dev, test, uh, and the various type of components. And as you can see, that they do about 94% of their testing at the UI level. Only 3% at uh, unit test level and API testing is also a further 3%. We also know from our research that Forrester did that only 45% of UI testing is automated. And I think in large organizations, that's even less, which means that there's still a lot of manual testing in organizations. And we can't really innovate at the speed of business if we only have one way to test our applications, and that's through the front end. There must be better ways that we can start testing a lot earlier on in the software development life cycle. Think about like building a car, right? You're not going to build the transmission, the carburetor, the engine, the chassis, put it together and for the first time take it around the track and hope everything s sticks together, right? No, you're going to build these components, test it to death, then put the parts together and take it around the track. So why don't we do it in software development? Why do we only wait till we have an end-to-end -end system before we start testing? We need to start to test at the component level. And that's really what our goals are. It's almost flip that picture on its head and say we have to do a lot more unit testing and a lot more API testing. Again, you know, some of my peers here this week is going to talk about containerization and microservices. And as applications are being broken down from monolithic to com modularized components, you, may, you need to test all of those components in isolation before you, you put them together and do true end-to-end -end testing. So really, we need to, to shift that. And, a, and the UI testing should really only become the last step in your process, the validation step of the user journey through my application, and not the other way around. So Computing UK did a study, uh, and they um, asked self-proclaimed DevOps practitioners um, where they think the biggest bottleneck is. And surprise, surprise, 63% of them mentioned that Keyway is still the biggest bottleneck there. So what are some of the challenges that face organizations around continuous delivery and continuous testing? So these are just some metrics um, that I've put up on the slide, might be a bit small to read. But 64% of defects can be traced back to unambiguous requirements. And um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on as well. 50% of developers spend their time fixing and finding defects. Because we're now in this fast-paced world, you know, where we need to knock out new features all the time, we don't really get to test the quality of our applications till it's in production. Therefore, the developers are spending more time firefighting in prod than they're actually adding new capabilities to the products that they develop all the time. 70% of testing is still manual. We spoke about that. And 50% of time, um, the QA team are waiting for test data. Now, it's great to say, you know what, I'm going to take a production cut of my database. But again, few people know that production data only account for 20 to 30% of your functional test cases. How do you get the rest of your data? You still have to create it by hand or by Excel spreadsheet or whichever means you, you find uh, necessary to create the data. Again, adding further delays to your software projects. And then almost 80% of the time you wait for downstream systems, availability of environments. You know, we spoke about that earlier on. It's great. If you can knock out new bolts on an hourly basis, not so great if you have to test each of those bolts in a dev test environment. So there's quite a lot of challenges that's holding us back. So, but before we can define what continuous testing is, we first have to see what it's not. So firstly, it's not just test automation. But by all means, it is a big part of continuous testing. It's not just continuous integration, but we do know that uh, testing fits into continuous integration as well. And it's not just unit testing, although it is a big part of it as well. 
And clearly, it's not just done in a single environment. Again, we've come from this whole waterfall type project methodology where everything happens in clearly defined stages across the SDLC. And testing was one of those stages. Instead, in a DevOps culture, testing should start happening a lot sooner. Actually, you can already start testing at the requirements definition phase already. And if we define continuous testing, that's exactly how we do that. We believe continuous testing is the practice of testing across every stage of the SDLC to uncover and fix those unattended behavior uh, as soon as that's injected into your applications or into your processes. So there's about 10 key elements of continuous testing. So the first one is about test automation. No surprise there. You know, we do need to automate a lot more and be a lot more efficient in how we script our test cases. Um, secondly, simulate test environments. Now again, if you look at the developer community, they've been doing this for ages through mocking and stubbing, right? You need to integrate with a backend system. It's not available. You go and stub it. But what happens if you pass it over to test? They don't have stubs that they can test against. So that's where things like service virtualization comes into play. It's an industry known um, term, service virtualization, not to be confused with server virtualization. And there we can simulate the behavior of backend systems so that when we hit testing, we can actually test as if those systems are readily available, whether it's mainframe, third party, ERP, whatever that, that might be, allowing us to start testing a lot earlier on. And also, th the more we test, the higher the quality, you know, from the book, uh, Jess Humble and David Farley, who wrote the continuous delivery book, you know, they do say that the more often you test, you know, the, the, or the more often you release and test, the higher the quality of the products that you take to market. And then the access to the data, I spoke about that, you know, it's great if we have production data, but what about all the, the rest of the data? What about those edge cases that we can't test with production data? What if we add new features? How do we get data for that? So really, data generation becomes a key part to that whole strategy of continuous testing. You need to be able to synthetically generate test data on the fly to support your specific set of test cases um, in order to, to drive this forward. And then start multi-tier backend uh, testing. So this is what some people like to call API testing. Um, I like to call it component testing. And really, again, the whole idea behind this is that we can't just do UI-based testing and, uh, and wait for the UI layer before we do proper end-to-end -end testing. Instead, we need to start develop, um, sorry, testing at each layer of the application stack as soon as we can. And through the use of concepts like service virtualization, whereby we can remove the constraints on the back and we do uh, API testing on the front, we can effectively isolate components within our application stack and test it completely independent from everything else, getting that cadence up that we so desperately need to keep up with our development practices. And then democratization of performance testing. Again, something that was exclusive in the world of performance engineering, and really we should start to look at things like um, test um, performance um, automation through the development cycle already. Um, you know, if you look at load engines, um, you know, you've got things like Locust, you've got, you've got things like um, Selenium even, they can do load generation, and also a JMeter. JMeter is a brilliant example of a tool that we can start creating load and performance scripts that we can execute even during development and not wait till we hit performance engineering. Because again, the longer we wait to uncover performance defects, the higher the cost of the organization, right? So the sooner we can solve those, better to the bottom line of the company. And then all of those tools have to be integrated. And also when we start to create our end-to-end -end pipeline, you know, through orchestration and automation, those deployment tools have to integrate with your test automation frameworks. The ability to do zero-touch deployment from the point where a developer checks in code into your uh, repository to the point where the code is deployed to new test environments test execution frameworks kicked off and promoted to the next environment without any human intervention. That's really where we want to get to. That's sort of the nirvana state we want to achieve. And then also, the insight we gain from monitoring those applications become very valuable. You know, long gone are the days that application monitoring is just something done in production to monitor the ops uh, teams and the, uh, the production systems. 
we should actually start doing this a lot earlier on in our projects. I know Bank of America, one, sorry, not Bank of America, uh, Bank of Australia, for one example, they do not allow a code push into production unless they've proven that they have sufficiently tested it with their APM tool in order to understand the performance characteristics. In fact, APM tools can now start to integrate into your CI build systems to say, you know what, if a developer checks in your code, I'm going to stand up an environment, deploy the code, run a benchmark test, and if the performance uh, latency is too high, I'm going to fail the build. How many organizations are doing that today? So, so but most customers obviously are on a journey and uh, they do aspire to get there. I've spoken about waterfall projects, which is sort of where we started back 100 years ago, I think. Um, and really, it was all about, you know, everything was well-structured, well-defined, and you had these silos. Uh, Christian spoke about silos as well this morning. And uh, this is a typical example where code is thrown across the, uh, you know, across the wall from the dev to test and from test to operations. And by the time it gets to ops, they have no idea what they're deploying in production. So really, we need to move on from there. So a lot of companies have started to embrace agile methodologies, whether it's Scrum, Extreme Programming, Lean, uh, or even if it's a large organization, some of the newer frameworks, like a scaled agile uh, framework. Um, but they're doing what I like to call water scrum for, which is <laughs> we are running two weekly sprints, but by the time we deliver the code to QA, they still take two months, three months to do quality assurance before that change is introduced into production. So all you've really done is you've shifted the problem from dev to test. You haven't exactly solved anything um, in the process. <laughs> and this is really where we want to end up. We want to end up with a, what I like to call the in sprint everything, um, whereby a sprint, let's say again, we take a two weekly sprint, you use that sprint to define your user stories and your backlog, you do your, your development, and you write your regression tests, your automated tests, and the execution thereof all within a two week. Because let's face it, when the guys from Scrum Alliance came up with the Scrum concept and they said the definition of done is when you have shipped your code, people didn't really take them seriously. Right? It's great to say I've developed the following features in a two weekly sprint, but I can't deploy it because I haven't yet tested it. Right? So really we want to get to the point where indeed after every two weeks we have shippable code that we can potentially deploy if we so choose to do so. And that's really where we want to end up. So let me just take a quick simple view of continuous testing and then I'll wrap up with that. So at the top you have all the continuous everything phrases. You know, you've got your continuous integration that happens in dev. We've got continuous testing, continuous deployment has also been discussed, and continuous delivery, all about delivering the, those features into the hands of your customers. But the continuous testing is, like I said, the one where I think you know, we've, we've neglected it the most uh, over the years. So within continuous testing, there are f five key areas that we need to look at. So if we start off at the requirements modeling phase of a project. Typically, business analysts will use Word and similar tools to define the, the user stories and the, and the use cases. But let's face it, language, like English, is great at writing poetry, not so great at defining requirements. Um, that does leave room for a lot of ambiguity in, in how you define these user stories. And um, really what we need to do is move towards a model-driven way of defining your use cases. So if you can start using things like flowchart diagrams, or even I've even seen some people starting to use mind maps as well to define your um, user stories, that's A, visual. It's easy to interpret. There's not a lot of ambiguity left to interpretation. And also, there's a nice side effect of all of this. Computer systems are great at modeling, not so great at interpreting language. So if we can start defining our user stories in flowchart diagrams, we can actually use computer systems to start analyzing those flows, if you will, throughout your application to understand what are the least amount of test cases that I need to derive from this user story 
in order to fulfill that particular requirements from a testing point of view. Because let's face it, from a testing point of view, what's the easiest thing to do? There's a new feature request. We don't go and re-engineer the test cases that we came up with last year. We add new test cases. So after a while, you get to a point where you literally have hundreds and thousands of test cases, and it's just impossible to maintain. Never mind the over-testing that you get from running all of these test cases all the time. And again, those are the kind of delays that is making it very difficult from a QA point of view to, to accelerate your software development practices. From a development point of view, I spoke about unit testing earlier on and TDD, test-driven development, is one of those areas that we can really look at um, from a testing perspective, the ability to write your test cases before you actually start writing a line of code. Now, I do know that from a dev point of view, it's very difficult to do. I know I'm working on some open source projects myself, and I always have to catch myself starting to write business logic before I actually start writing the test cases. So it is, it is a bit of a cultural shift, but it is important because ultimately, once you've write, written your test case, you then start creating your application. Once it, you validate that new feature, you then go back and you refactor your code and make it more performant and, and re restructure your, your application logic. And then you rerun your unit test again to ensure that it still passes all the checks. And that's really the kind of method or, or, or process that we should start to adopt uh, when we do software development. And then from a test design point of view, now again, this is linking back to the model, the modeling and the requirements phase. Again, if I do model driven development, I can use those models to derive a minimal set of test cases that I need to fulfill a particular requirement. And we need to do that in testing because there's no way we're going to keep up with the rate of change coming out of dev if we don't streamline our testing uh, principles as well. You know, we can't afford to run thousands and thousands of tests just because one small thing changed uh, in an application. In fact, um, there's one of the big um, uh, credit card companies in the US <laughs> where every time they make a functional change, it takes them five business days or five physical days to understand the impact that change has on their existing test cases. Can you really afford to spend five days understanding the impact before you, you remediate those test cases? Not really. And then test data. We spoke about test data earlier on as well. You know, it's great that we can take production data, but really we need to get to the point where we can intelligently synthetically create test data to support our test cases. And what's really cool is if you can link your test cases with your test data so that you know that for these particular test cases, this is the kind of data that I'm going to need. Again, allowing you to streamline your whole quality assurance process by only making available what's needed, effectively stripping out all the waste. Um, and again, in lean practices, we call it uh, the work in, process, work, work in pro progress the whip that you need to reduce in order to achieve efficiencies there. And then we need to automate uh, a lot of that. You know, 45% automation is not clearly good enough if, if we're going to uh, um, stay current with the rate of change going forward. And then from a test execution point of view, um, really test environments. I spoke about virtual environments or service virtualization earlier on. This is a key part to this. You know, we need to be able, even from a de developer point of view, say, okay, instead of mocking, I'm going to actually create virtual services so that when the devs hand over the code to QA, they can actually start using the same virtual services that, that were defined by the devs to start testing the application uh, a lot sooner as well. Um, and again, further removing those delays in the whole SDLC. And Bank of America in the U.S., they have this um, process whereby every time there's a code check-in, they stand up a new environment and they deploy their core banking application onto this new environment. And they use service virtualization to effectively mock um, the backends for their five core transactions. So those are like login, pay beneficiary, check balance, and so forth. If any one of those five core banking transactions fail, fail as well. They can't do that without something like service virtualization that will allow them to simulate those uh, expensive backends all the time. 
And then through your test automation engines, there are quite a few of those. You know, if you look at things like eggplant and selenium and Xenorex and UFT, these are all typical test execution engines that we need to start looking at. And really, as I said before, it's not just looking at the front end, but we need to start compartmentalizing our tests as well. So we can do protocol injection at an API layer, whereby we can test these components in isolation as well. And then monitoring is all about analyze, learn, and update the model. Um, I had a, had a nice use case the other day where, you know, what if you develop a mobile app and um, you think, okay, the layout of everything seems logical, but your target audience or your, your, your user base are people that commute in the mornings. Now, again, in South Africa, maybe not so much, but certainly in the UK, there's a lot of commuters on trains. And what happens is if you're on the underground train, um, you know, you hold on with one hand to the rail and your phone in your other hand. Now, if everything that you need to do on, from the phone's layout is on the opposite side of the screen, you're going to effectively struggle to, to navigate the application. That is real uh, tactile feedback that becomes part of testing because once I understand those changes that I need to make to my application, the model that we spoke about during the requirements modeling stage, we can easily go and update the model. And by doing that, we can instantly run an impact analysis to understand which use or test cases are impacted by this change in my design. And that way we can reduce the number of changes um, considerably in the process as well. So those are the, the five key areas that, that we see as, as part of um, the continuing adoption and evolution of organizations' continuous testing um, frameworks. So really, can you afford not to do testing? I mean, it's great to, to say that, yes, DevOps brings speed, but speed without quality can ultimately lead to disaster. Two out of three business leaders say their company's future absolutely depends on the quality of the software. Because let's face it, the software that you take to market is the storefront of your organizations. It is the brand of your companies. And if, the, the, if your customers are experiencing a, a negative brand, a negative experience, that's going to impact you in the long run as well. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you.